All right, Kevin. Kevin, uh, where are you from? Where did you grow up? Um, originally, I'm from LaGrangeville, New York. Um, it's about an hour and a half, two hours north of New York City in the Hudson Valley. Um, currently, I live out of my van. I'm sort of more of a nomad nowadays, and uh, it's sort of what led me to my accident. Your story. To begin with, yeah. The so, story. so you're a hiker? Yeah, yeah. I'm a big hiker. I like rock climbing and just screwing around in the mountains and stuff like that. So, um, so tell me what happened. So, uh, it just happened recently, right? Yeah. Yeah. This happened probably like two months ago, about, about 10 weeks ago. So, um, I guess I'll just take it from the start. Uh, it was a beautiful day and me and my buddy are big into rock hounding, going out and looking for cool rocks, wherever it may be, you know, but a lot of the times it's in these like really, really remote locations. And so, uh, my buddy just got a new job and we, made this plan to go up there and dig for rocks and everything like that. And at the time he was extremely sick. He had the flu and also he had bad back. Um, so, you know, we were stoked and not a cloud in the sky. It was like the most beautiful day possible. Um, so we slogged up there. It takes like about two and a half hours out in the uh, Inyo mountains in Eastern California, almost Nevada, actually. Um, like I said, super remote area. Um, and we get up there and we start digging and we were having a great time. Uh, didn't really think much of it, you know, uh, until it was my turn to start digging under this massive boulder that was perched up on a 45 degree angle hill. And so I'm used to digging under rocks all the time uh, and not, them not really moving, you know, they've been there for thousands of years, but this time it was different. Um, so basically we were digging under this boulder with this little scraper tool and uh, collecting some cool rocks, cool specimens. And I went to go step back for a second just to relax because it, it takes a lot out of you uh, scratching through all that rock and mud and whatnot. And so I went to step back for a second. And before I even knew it, I heard my buddy yell, Kevo, look out. And I look up and before I could even get out of the way, this massive six to 10,000 pound boulder hits my entire body and takes me off of my feet. And uh, it actually hit me so hard that it knocked me on my back. And so at that moment, I was sitting with a giant boulder basically in my lap and teetering on my chest, threatening to come down to my head. And so, you know, at first this all just felt like a dream to me. It, it didn't even feel like real life. And usually that's when you wake up from a dream, but how, I didn't how, wake up. How big was it? Um, it's about the size of a washing machine and a half, six to 10,000 pounds about. Um, so this thing was on top of me. And I just remember uh, once I came to the realization that this was real life, I, I kind of, I started thinking about life immediately. I yelled to him, you got to get this thing off of me. It's killing me. It's killing me. And I could feel the mass of the boulder couldn't move it at all. And like I said, it was teetering on my chest. So I looked up at my buddy's face and he had the most deranged look on his face I've ever seen. And we've done a lot of things together, like sketchy stuff in the mountains, but I'd never seen him make this facial expression. And so he starts saying like, no, no, this isn't happening. We got to get you out of there as he's panicking and trying to push the thing. And so he finds a second to grab this pickaxe that we were digging with and to come on my side of the boulder because I was facing uphill on a 45 degree angle and he stuffed that pickaxe right under the boulder right next to me so that it wouldn't keep coming down on my chest. And humans aren't used to being trapped under things like that. So naturally I was trying to squirm every which way that I could to try to get myself out of that situation. And I noticed that even though both of my legs were completely crushed, I had my phone in my pocket and I wasn't able to access it. I noticed that my left leg, uh, I was able to get it loose a little bit. And so I asked him if he could push that boulder up off of me a little bit. So what I did is I took that scraper tool that I was digging with and I cut my pants off. And so I was able to free my left leg and to maneuver up the hill so that I was out of the line of fire if it did continue to keep rolling down. So now I was in a situation where my right leg was fully pinned up to my knee. You can kind of see 
I still have the scars and everything. Um, and my left leg was sort of in like a butterfly crunch position. And so that's where I remained for about seven, maybe even eight hours as uh, we waited to contact people and try to be rescued in such a remote area. Um, there was a lot that happened though when I was under the boulder. I had a lot of realizations and one of the first realizations was, uh, wow, this is it, I'm gonna die. And this is it, there's no more left after this. And I remember looking up at the sky and thinking, man, I shouldn't have spent so much time in my life stressing about money. And if I could go back and do all these different things differently, I would, you know, I would try to give back to people more. And all this stuff was kind of going through my head thought about my family a lot. And this is only like split second things, but it feels like an eternity when you're thinking about this stuff. And so we got on a uh, call with the Inyo County uh, Search and Rescue. Well, not actually, it was the operator at the time. It was part of the Inyo County Sheriff, Sheriff's Department. And he was kind of guiding us through the whole thing. And I asked him multiple times, his name was Derek. I recently did a Google search for my own name, and what I found was pretty unsettling. Seeing my personal information out there for anyone to grab, it's just uncomfortable, you know? That's why I started using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura not only shows me exactly which data brokers are peddling my info, but also takes action by sending out opt-out requests on my behalf. They're selling everything from your email and home address to your health records, even personal stuff about your family. Data brokers are making a fortune off selling our personal information to anyone willing to pay for it. It's also protecting me from hackers who could exploit that information to wreak havoc on my life. Or it does more than just stop data brokers. It's like having a digital security guard on duty 24-7. From antivirus protection to VPN and password management, Aura's got it all covered. Aura does more than just stop data brokers. It's like having a digital security guard on duty 24-7. I'm too busy to deal with this stuff. But with Aura, I can go about my day knowing that my privacy is being safeguarded, leaving me free to do whatever I want with the rest of my day. So if you value your privacy as much as I do, Go to aura.com forward slash soft white underbelly to start your 14 day free trial. The link is in the video description box below. Now back to the video. I asked him, Derek, be honest with me now. Am I going to make it out of here alive or should I call my mom now and tell her that I'm not going to make it? And he didn't want to give me a definite answer or anything like that because he wanted me to keep fighting up there. Uh, Basically, my buddy said, he's like, I'm not letting you call your mom. He's like, you're going to make it out of here alive. So I was wondering if I was, if I was going to live or die based on the fact that I looked down at my leg and there is about this big of an incision from where your femur basically connects to your pelvis. And when I looked down at my leg, I saw all this stuff that you're not supposed to see. I think my brain blocks a lot of it out. I've talked through with my friend a couple times and he's like, Dude, I definitely saw your bone. Is that, what, is that what all the wraps are on? Yeah, so this is the leg of the initial impact. And uh, basically it was so bad from the initial force of the boulder that they had to go in and cut a bunch of tissue out. They had to repair my severed artery, which was perhaps the greatest injury that I sustained from it. Um, a lot of people, when you mess up your artery, especially in your leg, it only takes you seven minutes to bleed out. And mine was crimped in such a way that it created a blood clot, but it allowed me to stay alive. And uh, a lot of crazy stuff happened with the, ho the hospital and everything like that that I went to. Basically, they told me, they're like, we caught you just in time. Uh, you're lucky to even have your leg, let, be, let alone be alive. I mean, the rock very easily could have just crushed your head. Exactly. Right. And that's what was going to happen if my buddy didn't shove that, that pitchfork under there. Uh, pickaxe, sorry. Um, so I guess I could just talk about the whole survival situation for the seven hours that yeah. I was trapped, trapped. And uh, so there we waited for about seven hours. And like I said, we were on this really remote hill in the middle of nowhere. If my buddy wasn't with me, I wouldn't even be talking to you today. Um, so I was trapped under there. So you, you would have just been left there and no, yeah. no way to do anything? You for, could, for my could, body to just rot hands, up there. Were your hands free? My hands were pushed up against the boulder, just trying to keep it from coming down on my chest. I, I, it was on, so much on me that I couldn't really even breathe. 
But when he put that pickaxe under there and he was able to push the boulder up, I was able to free that left leg and kind of maneuver around the rock so that I was now on the opposite side of the rock so that if it kept tumbling downhill, it wouldn't have fully crushed me. Um, so when I was in that position with the leg pinned, we were trying to contact people to try to get them to come. And we were on the phone with the operator the whole time. Uh, he's basically telling me to stay calm and try not to stress out because the more you stress out, the more you'll pump blood through your leg and it would just create even bigger of a disaster. But uh, basically, so I sat there for seven hours. Like I said, uh, I became delusional at some points, kind of sitting there and trying to make it through the situation. Uh, like I said, I kept asking the guy, you know, am I gonna make it? Or is this such a crazy injury that this is just it? And I kind of felt myself falling asleep a little bit. And I had to remind myself to just stay awake and stay alive. My buddy was there to support me the whole time too. And I was getting so delirious that at one point I asked him for his hand so I could squeeze it. And I ended up grabbing his hand and just biting it. I was in so much pain and I was in such a deranged mind state that I, I wasn't even really thinking clearly. And uh, I guess it's worth mentioning during the initial impact that we also spilled all the water that we brought up there. So we had about 0.2 liters of water for the both of us for that whole time we were up there. And so, like I said, I went through different phases of being calm and absolutely freaking out and yelling at the top of my lungs. And every time I realized it's not going to help, so I'd go back to being zen. Sometimes I'd close my eyes and think, you know, maybe I want to just go to sleep right now and just relax and have this all go away. And then <laughs> my intuition would kick in. It's like, if you go to sleep, you're going to be dead. And so... During this time, uh, they called in a search and rescue helicopter just to come locate us. At that time, I thought they were going to come down and just start dropping down and, and start to rescue me, but it was just to get our location. So they came, circled around us like five or six times, and boom, flew right back off to the mountains and left us there. And uh, so we were sitting there for a while, right? Uh, I basically saw the change of temperature dropped like 30 or 40 degrees and mind you i cut my pants off so i had no pants on this whole time and we were just trying to stuff a bunch of everything that we had rain jackets and stuff like that and the whole time i was keeping pressure on that leg too just because you know i looked inside my leg and saw my artery and all this crazy stuff and it became so cold and my legs were shaking so bad when i was trapped under the boulder that it's causing a lot of pain so we actually made a fire right up on the hill next to the boulder and some of the ashes started to roll under the boulder where my leg was and I started freaking out but my buddy did a good job of stoking the fire making sure to keep me warm and everything like that he was really doing anything that he could to help and the operator would actually call and he, he'd ask him hey do you mind walking away from him for a second I need to talk to you and he'd basically tell him, he's like, you gotta calm him down. He, that's the only way he's gonna survive and make it through this. And I didn't know at the time, every time that he would go walk to walk off, I'd get all this anxiety and paranoia and all this stuff. Um, so that was the seven hours of waiting through that. Uh, it was insane to, to think that I had the thought if you can be in this sort of situation for let's just say three or four hours, what makes it so that you couldn't be under there for maybe four or five hours? The human mind is a strange thing. And uh, I still haven't fully figured it out, but there's gotta be some sort of Wim Hof trick or something to it where uh, you can sort of block things out in your mind so that they don't bother you as much. That's kind of what happened to me. And so I was waiting up there for a while and I started to think, you know, I, I haven't died yet and my leg's not bleeding out. I know that things are really screwed up, but I thought that I'd maybe have a fighting chance if I just stayed awake the whole time and just, just really try to hang in there. And uh, this leg was all mashed up against the rock, like I said, in like a butterfly did, position. Did, did you break any bones? Yeah, I cracked my pelvis in two different spots 
right here on the left and then right here on the back. But what was fortunate about the injury is when the boulder landed on me, I was in a bunch of sand. And so I think that uh, it got rid of some of that impact. Had I been on hard rock, it would have just smashed my leg completely. Surprised it didn't break my femur, but I did mash it up into my pelvis in the socket there. But the main injury that I sustained was that severed artery in the leg, which, and the initial impact, they had to cut out a bunch of dead tissue in here. And so eventually, it was, we watched the sunset, all this stuff. This happened around like 3 p.m. I think the search and rescue team got there at 9 p.m., which is extremely quick if you're in a survival situation where you need the search and rescue team to come get you. It usually takes an average of like eight to 12 hours. So I was very fortunate. Uh, and so I looked up on the hill and usually we walked up the hill from the bottom, but these guys found a way to come from the top. You had cell service there? So that's the crazy thing. My buddy just got a new Galaxy S23 Ultra or whatever, like the day after he got it and it had cell reception somehow. He had one bar of service, but if you go back down into digging in the hole, you don't have any service. Mm -hmm. It's only when you're just standing up. And it was just that one spot too, miraculously. But I saw the guys on the hill and I saw them with their headlamps start walking down. And I thought in my head, these gotta be the most badass motherfuckers I've ever seen in my life. So they come down and I'm, I'm like, finally, someone that can help. Uh, and they just start getting right down to business. You know, they have an EMT. He starts checking all my vitals and everything. While the other guys, I think it was a team of like four to six people. The other guys start actually drilling holes into the boulder and setting up these like rock climbing style hangers. Because even with the four or six of them, they couldn't have just like pushed that thing off my leg without causing either more damage or the thing was just too heavy. So they start taking out this rock drill and drilling holes into the rock and everything like that. And they actually created this pulley system where they were able to run a rope through those two rock climbing bolts and anchor it on a big boulder down below. And I think it's called like a seven to one pulley system. While they did that, um, this other badass Australian search and rescue guy, he pulled out this thing called a high lift jack, which is used to flip over Jeeps that have gotten stranded while they're off-roading. And he wedged that under the boulder and started cranking it up. And I started to finally feel some relief on that uh, leg that was trapped. And so uh, this had to be very strategically thought out because anything that they did wrong would have just caused that thing to come right back down on my leg and smash it even worse. And so they had to be really careful and it was in pitch black. So they finally got the pulley thing and they got the high lift jack and they started cranking it up while two guys held me under both of my arms. And they did three giant pulls. And on the third pull, I finally felt my leg finally be released. And so I thought that when they finally got me out of there, everything was just gonna be okay. But they pulled me out of there and I was on the ground and I couldn't really move much kind of just laying in a bunch of sagebrush. And around that time is when the rest of the search and rescue team showed up. So now there was probably like 12 to 15 people there. And usually when these guys are used to finding someone out in the mountains, their heads are all bashed out, they're unconscious, they're dead most of the time. The fact that I was still alive, I think just became kind of a big party for everyone. And so everyone was joking around and making jokes to me and everything like that. They were giving me tea, warming me up. And I was so envious that they were having such a good time because <laughs> it, was, it was one of the worst times of my life laying there, not knowing at the time that I had the broken pelvis and everything and the severed artery and whatnot. Um, and so they're like, oh, you're gonna be fine. You'll go to the hospital or whatever. They asked me which hospital I wanted to go to because I was halfway between Reno and Fresno. And the guys were saying, you should definitely go to Fresno. It's one of the most premier hospitals like in all of California it's for trauma. And so they, they basically contacted the, the Naval Air Academy out of Lemoore. And because usually normal helicopters can't fly at night, you have to have like some sort of special permit or something like that. So they contacted these, these guys and they told me, they're like, hey bud, you're probably gonna have to stay the night up here. 
And I was ready to just stay up there and wait till the next day. I was just happy to be not trapped under the boulder anymore. So I was getting prepared to stay the night. Everyone was just relaxing and having a good time. You, you weren't bleeding terribly? So I wasn't bleeding terribly, which was crazy because halfway towards like the rescue, my buddy said, he was like, I think you're gonna make it. You're not bleeding at all. Which if I did start bleeding, it's only about seven minutes until you lose all your blood in your artery. The boulder actually hit me in a way where your artery stems down here and then it branches off into two. I got hit right up here. So usually you could make it out if you, if you get hit in one of those lower sections, but I hit the main common femoral artery in my leg. But like I said, in such a way that it almost just crimped it and, and sort of stopped the blood flow, but it didn't completely sever it apart where I would just bleed out and that would have been that. Um, so that was that. They contacted the Naval Academy. I thought I was gonna have to wait till the next day but they were like, no, actually, they're gonna be here in two hours. And so I was just laying there. I was actually laying on my side of the pelvis that I cracked, because I didn't know my injuries at that point. So um, it got to the point where the helicopter started coming, and it did the same thing. It circled around like seven different times to try to get our location. And this is in the pitch black too, so these guys were doing the best that they possibly could. Um, a bunch of the other guys went up on the hill, and so I stayed down there with three or four of the team members. And so they slipped me a pair of sunglasses, and they said, you're gonna need these. I said, why? It's like, when that helicopter starts flying over us, it's gonna cause a lot of roto wash, which is gonna kick up all the rocks and all the dust and sediment. He's like, you're gonna be getting hit with shrapnel when they start to hover over us. It's like, all right. and. The whole time they were joking around with me like you're gonna have a good story after this one and everything uh so the helicopter's flying around and they have to burn off a bunch of fuel also before they can just like hover right above you so we were all down there waiting and it finally put its spotlight on us we were blinded i was just laying there with the sunglasses on at night and uh i could start to see some guy come down on a rope repelled out of the helicopter and it was a uh, naval medic EMT, and he basically started taking my vital signs and checked in with the other EMT. And he explained to me what was gonna happen. He's like, you're, you're gonna come up there in the helicopter with me. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna connect you to me and then we're gonna go straight up. And it was probably like 30 or 40 feet up in the air. I said, okay. At that point, they had me in this inflatable litter, which is basically like a big stretcher. And they transferred me to this really rigid, hard one. And so he's like, all right, you ready? And he's yelling at me the whole time too, because the helicopter's right above us the whole time. So he's just like shouting all this stuff at me. And he clips me to him and he's like, all right, we're going up. And so I, we started ascending and I was on this thing. Let's just say this was my head. The thing started going like this. And for a second, I thought I was gonna slip out of there and just fall straight on the ground again. Mm. But uh, luckily that didn't happen. I was grabbing onto the rope for dear life. Uh, I don't know if I should say this, but I accidentally banged my head on the side of the helicopter when they were trying to shovel me in there, which I thought in my head, this will make a good story later. Um, they finally got me into the helicopter. And like I said, all those guys were saying, oh, I think they were just messing with me. They're like, oh, it's gonna be fun. You know, you get to fly over the Sierras and you get a free helicopter ride, but it was the opposite of fun. The thing was shaking my whole body around. It's not the guy's fault because he was trying to do it in the dark, but he tried to put the IV in five or six times and kept missing. So I was just laying there, just trying to stay calm to make it to the hospital. Uh, and I'd close my eyes and lay back every once in a while. And he kind of just tap on me to make sure I'm still, still awake and still alive. And we were communicating through the notes app on his iPhone. He was letting me know how far we were, asking me if I was okay and fi we finally got to the hospital. Uh, I remember before they put me on the bed looking at one of the front pilots that was there, and he kind of just threw up these, and I'm like, these guys are fucking crazy, man. The fact that they do this for a living is absolutely nuts. So they shoveled me onto the bed, I got into the emergency room, and people just started pulling on my arms and legs and everything, they threw me in the, uh, CAT scan and whatnot. Uh, 
it was brutal. I didn't know what was happening at that time, what my injuries were. I was just happy to finally be in good hands at the hospital. And so when they told me that I had the severed artery and the, I wasn't surprised about the correct pelvis, I was surprised about the artery. And they said they needed to do emergency surgery on me. So I basically called my mom who lives across the country in New York. And I told her, I was, I was like, hey, I have to have emergency surgery. I got crushed by a massive boulder and pinned for over seven hours. And I told her, I was like, you don't have to fly out. It's all good, I'll take care of it. But immediately she got a flight out to come see me. Uh, awesome mom. But what really hit me, hit me the most probably was the fact that after all, all that and I was in the hospital, one day this doctor came in and he asked me, he's like, hey, do you remember me? And I'd seen so many doctors at that point. So I was like, yeah, of course I remember you. But he could tell that I didn't. So he's like, I could tell you don't. Uh, he's like, hey, man, I'm the guy who saved your leg. And at that moment, I like just busted into tears. I didn't even really how to know how to react to it emotionally because my legs are such a big part of my life. It's pretty much everything that I do. You know, I'd go hiking every single day. I, I couldn't even believe that. Uh, I couldn't even believe it, honestly. And down the line, I found out people were telling me, they were like, you came to the right place. You know, we took care of you. This is a great trauma center and everything. Had you had gone to Reno or something, maybe you wouldn't have been able to keep your leg. So not only was I lucky to have my friend up there to save my life from the initial impact of the boulder, but I'm lucky to even have my leg and be able to still walk and get back to normal life eventually. Um, I had 10 surgeries. A lot of it was dealing with scraping that dead tissue out of my leg. And I actually, I had to get a skin graft because the wound was so bad. Um, I still don't have feeling in this knee or my right foot, the one that was pinned. So I think I have nerve damage, but I'm waiting because nerves grow super slow. So I'm waiting to see if they'll eventually grow back. And also from the pelvic injury, it had my whole leg messed up. So I don't, I don't have a feeling in, in a lot of my legs, to be your, honest. Your broken pelvis has, has, has healed? It's still recovering. It didn't need hardware or anything like that, luckily. So it just heals on its own. So, yeah, it's... And you're, you're fairly young. How old are you? I just turned 27 last week. 27, yes, yeah, so yeah. you're young. And that's what they kept stressing as well. They were like, you're lucky, you're young, man, because luckily you'll be able to survive and recover through all this. What, what, what kind of thoughts did you have like during the accident, after, now? Like, What, what kind of things have you thought about and what, how has it changed the way you think? So many things, man, honestly. Uh, like I said, that initial thing where I looked up at the sky and I realized maybe I would have spent my life differently and told those people that I actually do love and care about, maybe I would have told them that a lot more often and if that was gonna be it, and if I was gonna die up there, and boom, end of the story, book closed, no more life, I don't think that I would have been fulfilled with the things that I've done in this life. And so that was a big feeling immediately right off the bat. Being, being so focused about money and things like that. Exactly, exactly. It's just always tripping about money and getting myself all worried, getting my mind in all these loops where at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You should just be happy to be alive and to be breathing and experiencing life. At that moment, I kind of realized how, life, how precious life really was. Um, so that was the initial thing. Right after the injury also, I had a lot of respect for all those guys that rescued me. You know, the Inyo County Search and Rescue Team and the Lemoore uh, Naval Station. It's crazy to say, but I actually like started thinking maybe I would like to do something like that down the road and try to help people or save people's lives. It's, it's the most impactful thing that's ever happened to me in my life. I couldn't even believe it that these guys do this as their normal job and go out and save people when they're at their absolute bottom lowest. There's some incredible, it's incredible. paramedics out here. Insane. And Firefighters, all that stuff. The Especially search and rescue is also non for profit too. So these guys could have just been eating dinner, or hanging out with their wives when they got the call. There's this guy that's trapped under the boulder. So that was another big thing. 
And I kept thinking about that too. I was like, I'd like to give back in some sort of way. I'm not sure what it is, but saving people's lives is probably one of the most impactful things you can do. Um, I also had a lot of respect for all the doctors and nurses who do this every day as their job. Sure. I had never spent time in a hospital before, you know? Uh, <laughs> it's crazy. I'd have the same nurse like every day sometimes, and I'm not the only patient they deal with. They deal with a lot of screwed up stuff there, you know? Uh, so I have the most utmost respect for those people and people that can work well under pressure where it's like, we got this guy in here, his arteries all screwed up. We're going to need you to go in, graft his vein from the other leg and put it in and do it all successfully under such short notice. That was incredible to me as well. So all of the rescue efforts and the nurses and doctors, I still think about this, that to this day. I, I can't believe it. I'd always be like thanking them and stuff. And they're like, hey, man, it's just what we do, you know? But to me, I just, yeah, I, like I said, I'd never been in a hospital environment, really. And so that was very impactful for me. And another afterthought is that, uh, you know, I always try to live life to the fullest. And I always try to influence other people to do that, too, whether it be just like getting outside and going and watching the sunset or something like that. Just try to live life in a meaningful way to you. You know, it's different for everybody. I thought that maybe I should set up some challenges for myself and some goals to work forward to physically after all this had happened in terms of like, I've always had it in the back of my head. I've always wanted to attempt a marathon or to run a marathon and have kids one day. And the fact that that thing didn't crush my family jewels or anything like that, you know, I'd, I'd definitely love to have kids one day and live a wor uh, life that is full and worth living. And so I guess that's... It wakes you up a little bit, doesn't it? Oh yeah, it shook me awake. Are you, are you still hiking and rock climbing and all that? I'm not able to really go hiking yet. Yeah, but it's been so soon. I can't wait to get back out you, there. You do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's a little scary too. I'd, I would do a lot of things that would sort of, uh, they'd be like kind of, fear but then you get over the fear right uh i don't i have different thoughts about that now you know exploring all these like old abandoned mines and stuff it would always just kind of be something that i'd go do but i definitely think about it much much differently and things could go wrong you know i've i've seen a dead guy in the mountains before luckily it's just some old guy that died from a heart attack and that was two years ago so i remember seeing that and it kind of set off an alarm in my head where I'm like, this is a real, like, brutal place. If you want to go play in the mountains, you got to be ready to get hurt and take that risk, you know? It's a dangerous place. And when you're out there, not that many people can come save you. And if they do, you're going to be sitting there for a while and you're going to be pretty lucky when they finally get there. But, but chipping away at the big, at these rocks and, and you, you actually created this rock, this rock yeah. to fall, right? unfortunately but and so that's another thing that i felt kind of stupid and guilty about for a long time and it was obviously an accident and everything like that and i'd asked my friend who had been doing it for years and he was with me and saw all this happen and it's crazy because i have like this striking image of him in my head directly under it with his back right under it like digging under it and i imagine us both in the impact zone of that thing. And I imagine it crushing us both. And we're both up there all mangled and no way to call for help or anything. And it just crushes us to death. So I felt kind of stupid for a while. It's dumb to go digging under a big boulder for sure. And we had done it plenty of times, you know? Usually the things don't move. People go rock climbing, they climb these big boulders. They don't usually move. And the thing's probably been sitting there for two or 3,000 years, maybe even longer. Probably longer, yeah. Probably longer, yeah. And so I guess it was just when he said that to me, he's like, he, he's like, I actually am struggling with this personally because I can imagine us both being in the impact zone, getting crushed by that thing. Or I could have been the guy on the outside watching him get crushed and just either way, it was a horrible situation. I think it worked out in the best possible way for the severity of what happened. Luckily, I didn't bleed out on the hill. But that's another thing that I also struggle with is uh, 
the whole thing just feels like a big dream to me. And sometimes I go about my day and I think, maybe that thing did kill me and I'm just in some big dream or a big coma right now and I just need to wake up. And whenever I say that to my close friends and families, they're, they're like, no, that thing definitely hit you and you were crushed and I hate to tell you, but you're still alive. Uh, in a joking way, obviously. But it's something that I've been struggling with as well. It's just like reality and trying to get used to all this and understand it, you know? I'll just be sitting on the couch relaxing and I'll actually feel that initial impact of that thing hitting me in my groin and it's basically like a giant sumo wrestler laying on your leg that you want to like get it off of you but no one can move it uh yeah <laughs> what, what, what would you say is the most important thing you've learned after going through this a lot of really important things always to come prepared for to stay the night even if you're just walking a mile or two out there because you don't know if you're going to come across somebody else that needs your help or if you're going to need to save your own life or what have you. So it's always good to come prepared. Um, I forgot the saying. It's something that piss poor planning uh, creates bad situations or something like that. Uh, it's like the seven P's, but piss poor planning, uh, it equals piss poor performance, basically. Mm -hmm. And so that was a big thing for me too, because I, I, I'm really into backpack and I like going ultra light and everything like that. But if, if all you have is a tarp to stay the night or to literally create a tourniquet around your leg or something, you're going to be screwed. And so that was a big wake up call for me is to just come prepared and come correct when you're going out in those mountains, because anything could happen to you. And if it's not you, it could be somebody else. Um, I also learned, obviously, to not dig under giant boulders, which won't be happening anymore, and to stay out of the old abandoned mines that all these earthquakes and stuff shift those rocks over time, and it can be very dangerous. You know, out of all the things that I do, rock climbing and doing all that stuff, this was kind of just or it's supposed to be a relaxing day where I just go look for rocks. And it made me realize that even when you are at your most relaxed state, uh, things can take a deadly turn and basically anything could happen out there. Well, I'm glad you got away with your life. Thank you. I, I am too. And I'm very happy to be here. Very thankful to my buddy, Josh Nelson, who was there with me because previously I had been up there for three days straight, just alone up there. And this easily could have happened to me. I'd probably still be missing and I wouldn't even be talking to you right now, mm -hmm. you know? I, it's very morbid, but I couldn't even reach into my pocket to get my phone. It was literally crushed under the boulder. And yeah, I probably would have just suffered a long, slow death up there, just getting crushed. And yeah, just like a decaying corpse. They probably would have found me next spring. And finally, this is where he was the whole time, you know? It was that remote where it's just that far out there. You, you're not going to see anyone out there. Oh, you're in the middle of nowhere. In the middle of absolute nowhere. You probably, you may come across some mountain lions or something like that, but I guess that would help you to die quicker, right? <laughs> All right. Kevin, yeah. thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you, Mark. I'm glad you, glad you survived. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you. That was awesome. Thanks, that was, man. That was great. Appreciate that.